What's going on Team Kestva? Rich back here again and today we have another code that we are going to be thumbing through and tabbing up to get you ready for the PE exam. Today we are talking about the IBC, the International Building Code. We're going to get in, I'm going to show you the tabs that I tabbed up when I was studying for the exam and what I used in the exam the, uh, in order to pass, I guess. I mean, the things that I found most beneficial to me, I'm gonna pass on to all of you, and hopefully it gets you one step closer to being totally ready for the PE exam. All right, let's get in there and let's go through it. See ya. So here we are, IBC 2015 edition. Now you'll notice 2015, if you look at the NCEES website for the PE exam, that is the edition that's gonna be um, relevant for the uh, 2020 October exam. Now that may change pretty soon. We've had the 2018 out for a while. We've had the 2018 out for a while. There it is right there. Um, it's in nice book form. So uh, there's not too many dis uh, dissimilarities, but uh, yeah, they are using 2015. So for anybody taking it after October, I think that change might happen. But again, it's not a, it's not a huge change. Um, this one I happen to have in a three ring binder, so that's just the way that I have it. Uh, there's no difference though if you have a paperback or something. So here's all my tabs that I used for the exam. Um, so the first tab I have is called Types of Construction. If I would just go to it, that would be, that would be good. So this is its own chapter. This is chapter six. Um, and this one is pretty straightforward. I found this is more obviously if you're taking the PE construction specific, then yeah, th this would dive in a lot more to what you want. But for structural and for just general, the general portion, um, you have your types of construction, so uh, classification. So that's um, really the only thing that I really needed in here. But uh, it also defines a lot of things, so roof framing, um, roof framing, floor framing, uh, exterior structural members, partitions and walls. So it defines a lot of things in terms of structures. So it's a good starting point. Uh, so it's, it's, it's good to have tabs just in case if you get one of those questions that uh, that's more of a, a knowledge base or, or going in through the code rather than uh, actual using equations and solving a problem. So I had that tabbed. Next. We have obviously the grand poobah of it, chapter 16, structural design. So if you are structural specific, you need chapter 16 for the IBC. That is the bread and butter. That is the, you know, that's the gold pot in this entire code. And now the IBC, remember, is a code. And the reason I bring that up again is because you're also going to be using the ASCE 7, uh, 710 for this exam, for the October exam. 716 is what I use nowadays, but again, not too many changes. And the ASCE is a provision. So that means it's a provision of the IBC. So the IBC is where it all starts, that's the code. And then you will see when you read through sections of this, like wind and seismic and snow and just about everything in this chapter, they literally start off by saying, hey, you know, go see, you can also use the provisions of ASCE 7. Um, to, to design and they get a little more in depth there. So that's kind of the connection between the two, but this is the base. This is where everything that is within the ASC 7 is based on the IBC, if anyone was confused. So chapter 16, I mean, literally just right at the beginning, um, I have started down here, construction documents. So flip to the next page. That just gives you all of the information that's required on your construction documents via this code. So there's certain things that must be shown and must be displayed on every set of construction documents to, in order to, for you know, the permitting process and the, in the, to create construction documents. So that's laid out here pretty simply. There's certain design criteria that must be shown, you know, that way in the future, if there's ever a retrofit to the building, um, other engineers can come back, whether it's 40, 50 years down the road, look at your design criteria and say, ah, this is what they use to design. Do I need to change that? Do I need, uh, you know, it gives, it gives them the knowledge they need in order to analyze your building accurately and figure out what the, you know, what the heck you were doing back then, because it can be very difficult to figure that out and find information. 
Next, not too far away, literally the next page, I have tabbed called it deflection limits. This is really good. So this is, uh, as you would think, deflection limits. And previous examples, I think one of them uh, in how to find deflection, uh, and I'll throw a little thumbnail up there, but we, we talked about, well, how do you, if you calculate your deflection, then from there, how do you tell if it's good or not? Well, here's your parameters right here, and here's your limits. Uh, so depending on what type of element you have, so roof members, uh, floor members, exterior walls, interior partitions, which is just interior walls, you have under different loading criteria, so live load is L, snow or wind, dead plus live, and then different types of uh, elements that are being supported, so not necessarily the structural element, but like, if you have a wood stud wall and it's holding you know, glass shingles or something, something super weird, or I guess I'll make it more relevant. If it's holding, um, here you go, if it's supporting plaster or stucco ceiling, which can crumble and can crack pretty easily under um, pretty light deflections, you have a higher deflection limit, so L over 360. Um, this is all the information in this table right here in order to give you those limits. So really helpful. Uh, I use this a lot, basically like every, every time I'm looking for deflection in my professional world, you come back to this basically um, to figure out what your limit is gonna be. So tab it, it's important, be good for the exam. Next, right on the next page. I mean, literally you could tab probably every page of chapter 16. I mean, it's that important, obviously for structural, but <clears throat> some of the high or some of the uh, bulleted things I'm just going over. So I have risk as my next uh, one, which is section 1605. Oh, I haven't given pages. Risk is uh, page 357. Deflection limits is 355. And uh, chapter 16 starts on 353. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, risk. What do you think it could be? Risk category of buildings and other structures. So they give you a table, and what they do is, we know, risk category one, two, three, four, but it gives you a definition. It's, there you go, nature of occupancy. So it really breaks down as to what does it mean to be risk category based on your type of building. It talks about number of occupants that can be in it. It talks about um, building types. It talks about types of facilities. So. This gives you all the information you need to define and say and accurately say, my building is risk category three, four, two, one. So really easy. You don't just have to guess and be like, well, I guess it's like not that important of a structure, so it's risk category one. This really, by definition, breaks it down for you. So always keep that handy. It's good to know. Next tabbed it up, called it foundations. So now we're on page 423, 423 and 422. And what you'll see here, really important table, is um, uh, load bearing values of uh, soil classes. So you have class of material, and then it gives you your uh, foundation pressure, so vertical foundation pressure and PSF based on your soil type. And also give you, gives you lateral bearing pressure right here. So PSF per foot below natural grade. So as you keep getting lower and lower, um, it's PSF per foot. You have a uh, coefficient of friction, and then you also have cohesion for uh, clays and sandy clays. So that's your lateral sliding resistance. So here's your fee, you know, your, um, I'm gonna call it a fee factor uh, for friction uh, calculation. So for sliding calculations for your foundation design, we've done a couple uh, examples of foundation design. If you didn't have criteria from a geotechnical engineer, here's where you can reference back. This is this is your guy right here to get you your minimums, kind of your base values based on a soil class that you have. So here they are. And one little note that I want to point out is this guy right here. So increase for poles. Um, if you have a pole foundation, and you are allowed, let's see, what does it say? Um, isolated poles for use such as flagpoles or signs and poles used to support buildings 
that are not adversely affected by a half inch or a half inch uh, motion at the ground surface due to short term lateral loading shall be permitted to be designed using lateral bearing pressures equal to two times the tabulated values. So you get to slap a multiplication of two onto these values when you're designing um, if that criteria works out for you. But it's a nice, that's a nice thing that uh, we use a lot if you're doing pole design because most of the time pole design is like a flagpole or a street sign or something and you can get away with that half inch um, motion. So. You know, the code is not always there to hammer you down. Sometimes it can be there to give you, you know, better design criteria and give you way, ways around things to design more efficiently. Quick little pit stop I wanted to show all of you that I thought was pretty cool um, because I wasn't able to reference it last time, but on page 358, if you look here under exceptions, under uh, load combinations, in our seismic uh, PE example problem that we did last time, uh, one of the one of the um, statements was, "Hey, do you need to apply snow loading criteria to to your building um, in order to accommodate seismic mass?" Well, if you look here under exceptions, you see number two: flat roof snow loads of 30 psf or less, and roof live loads of 30 psf or less need not be combined with seismic loads. Um, where flat roof snow loads exceed 30 PSF, 20% shall be combined with seismic loads. So there it is, there's your area. I had referenced back to it, but or I had talked about it, but I didn't reference specifically where it was. So there you go. That is chapter 16, so 605.3, load combinations using allowable stress design. So there's an exception right there, and I'm sure that same exception is gonna be in LRFD design. but. So there's your threshold, 30 PSF or less, you don't need to consider it. So there you go. And I even had it start when I was studying. So, wow, look at that. Great times. Next, we have embedded posts and poles. This is on page 427. So we're just talking about that a little bit, um, but now we get into really how to design those post footings. And, and this chapter, by the way, is all soils and foundations. So we're out of chapter 16. This is actually chapter 18. So just keep that in mind. Um, but what we have here is uh, safety factors. So we've talked about this before. This is not just for posts and poles, but this is for retaining walls right here. And uh, again, when we were designing foundations, I actually gave you some criteria for factors of safety that were uh, slightly conservative. But in the code right here, if you read it through, it says basically you for sliding and overturning moments, you can use a factor of safety of 1.5 minimum, and you use load combinations um, for nominal loads of 1.0, and then for earthquake loads of 0.7. So you can design that way, or you can design um, for standard load combinations, and then just solve straight up without uh, a factor of safety. But here's where you can find it. So 1.5 for factor safety when when you're doing that method um, given right here in the code. So apologies on that. Now we move over to embedded posts and poles. So now you're in this section. And what the two big things I wanna give you here are, you have two conditions when designing post footings. You have a non-constrained case and a constrained case. So a non-constrained case is when you have um, a post in the ground and it's just, let's just say there's just dirt around it. So you have a post with, uh, with concrete footing but it's all just dirt around, that's gonna allow, that means it's unconstrained. So when the post is here and the wind blows, let's say in extreme cases, like it's just gonna do this because the soil on either side of the post all around it can't constrain the base and stop it from rotating. So the whole thing's just gonna rotate, which means um, your equation is gonna be a little conservative and it might give you, most likely it'll give you a deeper footing design. But that equation, to give you your depth of footing is right here. So it gives you that, it gives you all the criteria you need. Then on the next page, like you might expect, you have constrained. This is on page 428. So now again, constrained is where you have your, your post, but let's say it's in a parking lot and now there's a concrete cast all, you know, a concrete sidewalk cast all the way around your footing. 
Um, so now that's a constrained post. So now when the wind blows, you actually have concrete sidewalk that's locking in that post and it's not allowing it to rotate. So it's keeping it constrained. That is a different set of equations to determine the depth of your footing. So D is the depth of your footing. So you have your equations here and you have your criteria that they define the criteria for the um, variables within the equations. So two good spots, use it all the time. That's where they're at if you're gonna do post foundations. Next section, chapter 21, masonry. So if you don't have your masonry code, um, this is just another location to give you information on masonry design. It's not, so again, this is the code, so it's not necessarily how to design masonry, but it gives you all of the code requirements and it does give you some good bits of information in here, definitions, um, variable definitions, all that kind of stuff. So, and there are, there are a few equations in here. So I didn't use this too much, I'm not gonna lie, but I did have it tabbed during my studies just to be prepared. I really used information from this as well as the information in my um, civil engineering reference manual, my CIRM. And that was all I used for my masonry um, to take the test, or my masonry information to take the test. I didn't go, I didn't bring the code because I didn't know it that well, so I knew I was gonna spend way too much time just kind of digging around. So I had a couple problems, example problems, as well as this and the CIRM portion tabbed up. Just, you know, to let everybody know. And this is on page four, uh, 458, 457. And this whole chapter, chapter 21, is uh, um, CMU design. So similarly, next I have wood. So chapter 23 is wood design. And again, um, this I didn't use all that much in, in the exam, but it was just, it was there just in case. It's another reference area for wood design. But really, I knew wood pretty well at the time. Oh, I, I know it well now. <laughs> and... I knew that I knew the NDS uh, pretty well and had that tabbed up very well. So I really just went to the NDS only um, during during the exam. So this wasn't all that relevant to me. But again, it's an, just another source of information. If you like the stuff in here and it builds your knowledge, I mean, it's going to build your knowledge regardless if you take a look. So I suggest reading through chapter 23. And it mimics, honestly, a lot of the information in the NDS code because again NDS also references back to this so and then lastly this is a little kind of extra bonus thingy we have chapter 33 so safeguards during construction this was actually and then right here construction safeguards site work um, slope limits surcharge uh, so all of this information was I found more useful for the uh, for those construction questions that you have. So it's a smaller section, especially for the structural specific, but um, I still found this, uh, the location where pretty much all the answers were for construction related questions that they could, they could ask you in terms of codes. So I tabbed this and I actually did use this when I was in the exam. So I recommend just tabbing this, chapter 33, reading through it, getting an idea of what the most important things are in here, especially if you're structural specific. Read through and really keep track of what are they talking about structurally that's very important because those could appear on the structural specific exam. And chapter 33, that's page 591. And that's gonna do it. So not too much there, but definitely um, good information. So you should be tabbing this up. You should be reading through it. I know, it's just like a great read. Trust me, it's not dry at all. It's so good. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Whew, that's it. We made it. Got through the whole thing. Again, it was just a quick skim through and showing you what I found most beneficial and also areas that I still use on the most regular basis in my professional career. There's many other locations, and again, um, I will specify, we also reference back to the ASCE 7 a lot. Um, it, that's mostly what governs nowadays, um, but everything, it's, it's a hand-in-hand. Hand. It's the IBC and the ASC 7 hand, provisions hand-in-hand hand that work together to dictate how we design our structures. But I hope you liked it. Give it a like if you did. Uh, tell someone else who is also studying or someone who you think might find these 
enjoyable or beneficial, you know, these videos, and let's keep, let's keep going, let's keep spreading the word. Guess what? We're almost at 500 group members, so this is gonna be so cool. That team is getting jam-packed. We're gonna need to open up another floor on this freaking office that we got going on here because the team is just getting way too big, so I'm loving it. I don't know if you think it's possible, but I think we can go from five to 1,000, like, super quick. The way we're gonna do that is word of mouth, so let everybody know that you're loving this channel, you're loving the information, and I will see you in the next one. Later.